and he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Your spirit being is just as right as he is. You're not almost like God. You are exactly like Jesus. Amen. That's your spiritual DNA. And don't you ever let anybody talk you out. The thing that struck me when I got to the throne of God, I'm going over a lot of things. Souls. The difference between a spirit and a soul. Soul look about this big. The only way I can say that. They got the ability to fly. They look like they got little nightgowns on. And they're, they're coming out of this power, this energy source. God, the throne sounds like this. I mean, if you just move, it'd annihilate everything. Mm -hmm. And then I real I could hear these little voices. And they would fly into that smoke and that power. And they'd say, would you send me to the earth? Would you make me a spirit? Would you let me be a spirit? And then I realized that that's the souls that God. And he went. And when he breathed, they just. Boom, just flew out, sent to the earth, souls, and made spirit. See, a souls mind. yet to be born. Yes. And this is the time to sow seed, financial seed, to protect your future from financial harm. And do not take me lightly and don't shut me out and don't leave because the anointing is still on me. And I want to pray under this same anointing that God will protect you from financial harm, not just disease. The same power that brings healing will bring prosperity, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. And the Bible says, I have not seen the righteous forsaken or received begging for bread, meaning the future is secure only in the life of the giver. Hello everyone, welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Some think that the greatest threat to the visible church comes from outside the church. But really, the greatest threat to the visible church doesn't come from outside the church, it comes from within the church. And we see that happening more and more today with false prophets, false apostles, and false teachers. As a matter of fact, Jesus warned us about false apostles, false prophets, and false teachers when he said in Matthew 24, 24 through 25, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. And so that is exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about ways that false teachers ensnare people. And you're going to want to stick around for this because this is this is a very important video. Joining me to help me talk about this is my very good friend from Famine in the Land, Rick Becker. Rick Becker is the curator for the Facebook page Famine in the Land and the website Famine in the Land. He also has a growing YouTube channel. And I mean, it, it's he's only been on YouTube for three months and it has he's already got over 2000 subscribers. So his channel is really taken off and he's got some fantastic content over there. I'm going to put all of the links to where you can find Rick uh, in the YouTube description. So Rick Becker, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much, Daniel. It's good to be here, finally, uh, again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, first time on video. We did do a podcast together, though, didn't we? And I did put it on YouTube. So it, it is there, and I, I'll, I'll put that in the description, too, because, uh, man, that's, I don't know, it, it, it's it's an old one. So <laughs> a couple of years, three, four, wait, <laughs> yeah. five years ago, yeah. isn't it? Probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we did, too, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Rick, thank you so much for joining me today. Why don't you give a brief bio about yourself, let everybody know who you are and why you do what you do? Sure. Well, um, briefly, after high school, two years in the South African Air Force and then four years in uh, Bible College, it was affiliated with the uh, Baptist Church, but slowly sort of uh, moved into the charismatic renewal. But anyway, after my studies, I spent a year with the Youth of the Mission in Hong Kong, and then met my wife, got married, and then uh, was called as a youth pastor to a small church. And uh, that's where things sort of progressively started getting worse. And uh, it was just at the time when Toronto Blessing was uh, sweeping the globe. 
So I started seeing a lot of uh, practices and, and teachings and manifestations that uh, made myself and my wife very uncomfortable. So I ended up resigning, preached my last sermon, which was uh, on <laughs> deception in the church. And uh, that began a sort of long process of coming out of, you know, of uh, deprogramming and, and unlearning all the things I'd learned. Um, then, uh, you know, and in those days, there, there was no internet. So you couldn't just Google, is uh, Joel Osteen a false teacher or, or anything yeah. like that? So it was quite a long process. But eventually, yeah, I've been in, involved in other sort of forms of ministry part-time. And the last time was about nine years ago. I was an assistant pastor in a small church in another town, assisting the, the lead pastor. His name is Stephen Collin. And uh, he subsequently left, uh, he went back to the States, and I moved to Cape Town. And uh, he furthered his studies there, but uh, in theology, and he's come back, but he's now passed at uh, Grace Fellowship Church in Pretoria. So he unfortunately doesn't have the time uh, to help and be involved. But this was actually his idea to begin Family in the Land. Mm -hmm. And uh, how it started is uh, one day uh, when we were still working together, he sent me a podcast to listen to, and it happened to be uh, Fighting for the Faith, uh, Chris Rosebrook. And uh, so we thought, you are, you know, we need to start warning people in South Africa because really, uh, South Africa is a cesspool of uh, false churches and then self-ordained and self-appointed apostles and prophets. So that's how it all began. And, and then uh, subsequently, I met uh, Stephen Kozar and uh, then yourself. And uh, so, you know, without your guys' help, uh, really probably would be nowhere. And I must just make mention of uh, Jake Elliott from The Framework as well, mm -hmm. who's been a great encouragement. So you guys have really uh, set the standard and encouraged me to keep on doing what I do. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that. And your your work has really benefited us as well. So we, we really appreciate that. Um, you know, you, both of us have been, um, have been, you know, uh, hurt by false teachers. J just about everybody that watches this channel has been hurt by false teachers or false teaching. Um, and, you know, the Bible is absolutely just filled with warnings about false teachers. I believe, if I'm correct, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, every book in the New Testament minus one warns about false teaching. Um, the Apostle Paul uh, mentions false teaching, you know, in Acts chapter 20, when he was standing there on the shore, on the beach there, talking to the elders of Ephesus, and he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So, it, it's a big deal to talk about false teachers, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the only book is Philemon where, where it's not mentioned, but uh, we were warned about these days, and uh, yeah. yeah, we need to pay attention to the warnings of Scripture because we, we're living it out right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Rick, let's go ahead and dive right in, because the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic is because um, you wrote an article several—I I, I don't actually— remember the date but you wrote an article a while back called 10 ways a uh 10 ways false teachers ensnare people and uh each of these ways are, are is exactly what how the bible describes these people that call themselves teachers they call themselves um sheep with within the the body of christ but they're actually wolves and uh great article so i'd love to dive right in and talk about each one of these points and uh just give examples for how this works what do you say yeah let's uh, let's go ahead all right, Rick, so let's go ahead and start with point number one. And point number one is they are established in the church. And how are they established? They establish themselves because they prey on new Christians. Isn't that right? Definitely. I mean, and the church, this is the thing. The church is their hunting grounds, the visible yeah. church. And, and that's where they get their prey, you know. And, uh, yeah, as I said, you know, they, uh, Jesus warned about uh, wolves in sheepskins or sheep's clothing. But uh, we're at the point today where they hardly need a sheepskin. Uh, the heresies yeah. are so blatant, and people yeah. are just uh, you're not prepared to test uh, and compare what is taught with the Word of God, unfortunately. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another another thing that they do is they not only do they prey on new Christians, but they're they're preying on undiscerning Christians. And and I'm not saying they're these Christians that are undiscerning are 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 
you know, unintelligent or stupid or anything like that. But they're just they they've been taught that. Um, well, if you speak out against one of their teachers, then well, you're speaking out against God's anointed. And what is the famous saying? Touch not God's anointed, right? Correct. Which which in context actually meant that David wasn't supposed to kill. Uh, yeah. King Saul. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we don't want to go around and, and chop the heads off of false teachers. And, right. Uh, you know, another, another point missed there is every Christian has been anointed, of course. But, uh, you know, because they elevate themselves, that's not exactly what they teach, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, we're, we're told, we are told to test. We're told to test a false prophecy. We're told by John not to believe every spirit. I mean, this is a command from Christ. Yeah, it, it, it's not optional. It's not something, you know, it's right. not optional. and it's, it's not for certain people. It's for every believer. Uh, yeah. you look at the example of, of the Bereans, you know, here comes Paul. And uh, I think his reputation preceded him. And they probably heard about all the mighty signs and wonders that he did. And uh, what did they do? They went to the scriptures to see if what he was yeah. teaching was actually in the law and the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. And they and they didn't say, you know, Paul didn't say, Hey, wait a minute. I'm an apostle. What right do you have to to test me? What right do you have to 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 see if what I'm telling you is fact? Don't you know who I am? Uh, he, the, the scriptures say that they were commend. They, well, the scriptures commend them for it, you know. And that's exactly what we're to be. We're to be Bereans. So, exactly. all right. Uh, uh, another thing, Rick. Another thing that establishes these guys is. Their uh, teachers like Dr. Michael Brown, um, one of their, you know, one of their top um, theologians, the guys like Remnant Ra the Remnant Radio guys, when they start promoting people like Todd White or people like uh, Isaiah Saldivar, they are uh, actually harming the body of Christ. And they are, like John says in 3 John, really they're taking part in their, or 2 John, I believe. Yeah, it was 2 John, where John says that anyone who does this takes part in their wicked works. Um, so they are constantly promoting false teachers. I'd like to uh, play you a clip, uh, if that's okay, and then I'm going to get your thoughts on it. Okay. All right, this is Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown is with me and I am ecstatic. Listen, I've been waiting for this for a while. I am so <laughs> glad you're here. We are going to have a powerful program. Well, Dr. Michael Brown, thank you so much for being on the broadcast. You know, before we jump in and talk about your new book, I just want to just, we're, this is going to be an amazing conversation, but I want to start by you defining what exactly revival is. There are three different times in my life that I realized I'm dealing with Jezebel. The first time was right after God gave me a prophetic message to America to the, for the church to wake up, a wake up call for the nation with a promise of revival. Next thing, all hell broke loose against me and against Nancy. She got it started. She got hit, my wife Nancy, with everything she never got hit with before. Where's this coming from? I got hit. The enemy's telling me, you're coming down. I felt no authority. I felt no ability to minister. And I knew. Now, well, 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 if you knew this guy the way I know this guy, when he says he didn't even want want to go out and minister, you know that's something strong. What, what? Got Jennifer LeClaire on the line. Hey, Jennifer, welcome back to the Line of Fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, how are you? Doing, doing well. So little did I know that our, our short little interview about 10 days ago would, would spiral into me now being told if I don't disassociate you as a false teacher, which I understand means a hell-bound heretic and deceiver, that I, I myself am, am a hell-bound heretic and deceiver. I'm sure that's not the first you've heard that, but <laughs> came with a bit of a swirl. All right, Rick. Um, one of the reasons that I created that compilation of clips is to show the different false teachers that Michael Brown promotes. Um, and I could I could go on and on because he's been with Vlad Savchuk and some of the other uh, demon slayers, I believe, um, Isaiah Saldivar. And so it, it just... The list goes on and on. Um, and he constantly is holding these teachers up, teachers like Sid Roth. He's holding them up in high regard. He is uh, promoting them to the church, saying, oh, you know, we may not agree with everything, 
here, but you know that's okay because uh, hey, we we can find common ground in the gospel and 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 in other areas. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons why I made this clip, just just to show. And and the next clip as well with Remnant Radio, we'll be looking at in just a second. But I mean, th- this this is really a big deal. Some might not think it is a big deal, but it is a big deal. And I know Michael Brown doesn't think it's a big deal. Michael Brown thinks he's doing the right thing, but Michael Brown's not doing the right thing, is he? No, this is really a, a big problem, and uh, I think it stems, you know, part of the problem is that uh, we can get so, uh, we, we put so much trust in the leaders in the, in the church, and, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's got a degree, Dr. Brown, like you said, he's an intelligent man, and then the other thing that sort of leads people to trust in them is that they do have the odd good teaching. I mean, Dr. Brown is very firm on certain sins and uh, he he doesn't compromise in certain areas. And so because you accept that and you you, you admire his boldness in one area, you get sucked in and and, and this is is the problem. And I mean, um, you know, Romans 16, you know, mark and avoid those who bring a a doctrine contrary to what we see in the scriptures. And uh, ironically, I mean, you played uh, the last last person there was Jennifer LeClaire, right? So right. for those who don't, who don't know, she's the one who came up with a, a sneaky squid spirit <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah. it, it invented all kinds of spirits when, when actually, you know, the works of the flesh are attributed to a demon. So instead of uh, dying to self and crucifying the mm-hmm. flesh, uh, people like her and demon slayers come along and chase out, you know, something. But it's funny enough, I was actually uh, watching one of her teachings uh, last week and uh, she, was, she was speaking about how dangerous it is to live wherever there's a large body of water, like the ocean or a lake, because of the numerous water spirits uh, in that area. So I was wondering, you know, does, 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 this, does this lady ever take a bath? Because you're going to plunge yourself <laughs> in, into water, you know? So it, it just, it is so ridiculous and uh, tragic. And, and, and I'm thinking as well, you know, now that I think about it, Dr. Michael Brown, he also defended Christ alignment once, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. And that is a reticle occultic posse down in, in Australia who attend yeah. uh, New Age fairs and offer readings for a small amount. That's, by the way, is Ben Fitzgerald from Awakening Europe. That, that's his mother. Mm. So Dr. Brown is giving credence to all these false teachers. And it's really sad, you know, Daniel, because um, he's going to be accountable before God one day for leading people into deception by his association and even platforming with and giving a platform to false teachers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he defends himself constantly over and over again. You know, I, I think about, you know, I mean, he talked he, he talked about making a prophecy there on Sid Roth. And speaking of Sid Roth, he's constantly defended Sid Roth because he knows Sid Roth and Sid Roth is his, you know, his good friend. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just sad. And, and yet Sid Roth has some of the most blatant heretics on his show. It's just absolutely mind boggling to me that he can uh, sit there and defend Sid Roth or Kevin Zadai. He's he's defended Kevin Zadai and wrote a forward to Kevin's Kevin Zadai's heretical book. We'll look at some of the things that uh, Kevin Zadai says here later on in the program. And uh, some of the things that he's saying in this clip is actually in the book that Michael Brown uh, wrote a forward to, you know, so I mean, it's just, just yeah. absolutely, it, it just, I, I don't understand it. I, I really, I really just don't, you know, but we also have the remnant radio guys doing the same. Now, the difference between, I think the remnant radio guys is they, they, they try to have, um, all, all genres of Christianity or all branches, kinds of, you know, branches of Christianity on their program. I believe Jordan Cooper, who has, uh, been very influential in, uh, me, uh, becoming a Lutheran, uh, was on the Remnant Radio uh, program. And so, I mean, that that's a difference. But they are still very weak when it comes to um, defending biblical truth. So let me play this clip for you. This is another compilation of, of them with their guests. So check this out. So everyone in the chat would say, I'm a Christian. A demon could never be in me controlling me. So we have these oppressed or possess. If I post something right now on Instagram, uh, Christians can have demons. 99.9% of the comments are going to come and say, Christians can't be possessed. Christians, I didn't say possessed. I said, Christian can have a demon. Mm. And I always go back to 
like you said, the daimonizomai, the original text, is to be under the power of a demon. We need Mike to introduce himself. Okay, he oversees the International House of Prayer. I, I think we've got that. Yeah. Just, all of the blogs on the internet about him are completely true. So <laughs> go, just go, just go read any oh, of them. No, and just they, read any of them. That's your introduction, and you'll get, you'll your, get your introduction. Your introduction. Yeah, like one guy was so excited, and we were meeting. He goes, "I just love it." He goes, "I want to, I want to hear all your stories." I'll go on the internet. I said, "Please don't." <laughs> this is something that I'm interested in because I've heard you say. You know, Jesus did everything as a man, but even more recently, I've heard you say he never stopped being God. Never. Can you can you unpack that yeah, for yeah, me? Yeah. Give me? Give me your well, understanding. Can I just read the Bible? Yeah, please. Oh, hey, hey, we're, <laughs> oh, we don't have to ask us. That. You want to do? <laughs> yeah, not, not on the theology yeah. program. You know? Okay. No, no, no. I just want to yeah, read. Yeah. I have so many. I love the U version because I've got yeah. all these different translations. Absolutely. So good, but I would love to read. You own Philippians too? Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you see there the compilation. And I, and I often wondered, um, and, and I don't know, you know, I, I took that clip from them speaking with Mike Bickle um, from Stephen Kozar's video. Yep. I don't know if they, I don't think they have, I, I'm, I'm almost positive they took that video off of their, um, off of their channel. I mean, it's quite embarrassing that you're up there defending Mike Bickle like that and then within what a month month and a half maybe two months everything just the the, the you know the dam erupts <laughs> and everything is it, you know it breaks loose you know what i mean yeah and you see that that that's the same problem as dr brown because dr brown's test for discerning or testing a false teacher is is basically one point i know him i like him and i've had mm. dinner with him you know, and if you pass that test, and that's the same with Bickle, you know, um, and they did take all those uh, videos down. And the problem there is, um, is that uh, sitting right under the nose of all these uh, people who believe in discernment and prophecy and words of knowledge was a credit in their midst that they didn't discern. It's a big yeah. problem. Yeah, big problem. Um, and that's a good point to bring home, Rick. These people are supposed to have the gift of discernment. These people are supposed to have the gift of prophecy. God speaks to them all the time, and yet God did not warn them about a a a predator, like you said, a an abs an actual predator, right there in their midst. Same thing with Robert Morris, by the way. You know, no nobody really uh, nobody knew about Robert Morris. You had Troy Black prophesying really good stuff about Gateway and Robert Morris throughout <laughs> throughout the years. He never no, nothing nothing negative there. You know, so so it, you know the the burden of proof that these guys are prophets fall on them. They have to take. They're the ones that have to prove that they are actually prophets. Exactly. And, and I mean, can you think of one historical event that you and I have lived through? Uh, mm. COVID, uh, the most recent uh, the attempted assassination of President Trump. None of them have nope. any uh, insight into what's coming ahead, but they'll know all about the next season that God is taking the church through. <laughs> I was watching a prophet uh, from, from Bethel, and she said, you know, she, she had this encounter with God and she saw the lightning come off his robes and blah, blah, blah. And the Lord told her it's a time to gaze upon him and he's going to re release love. Uh, you know, where is that in Scripture? And why would he tell him these um, very important seasons, apparently, that the church is going through? But he can't tell us, you know, what's going to take place in the world tomorrow that's basically going to change change the way that the world is. You know, after, you know, the, the, the pandemic, a lot of things changed in the world. Didn't yeah. see it coming. And, and, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You know, Chris Vallotton once uh, gave a false prophecy. He said there's going to be a huge revival in Russia and that they're going to come up with a new make of uh, motor vehicle. That obviously hasn't come to pass, and he never saw the war. You know, just crazy. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I tell you, it, it's, it's really just um, it, it's mind boggling that they can come up with these weird prophecies and uh, always prophesy about, you know, really good things. But never foresee the the, the disasters that that uh, come upon, you know, the church and 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 the world as as a whole. Um, exactly. So yeah, it just just really really bad stuff. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So let's uh, that that's that's how they are established, right? So let's talk about point number two. And you know what? I'm looking at the time, and you and I may not get through 
every single point. So I'm going to make sure that I put a link to the article down in the YouTube description, just in case we don't. Um, this is a really good conversation. I don't want to shorten, you know, I don't want to, you know, rush it to get to the other points. So uh, let's go ahead and, and talk about how false teachers exploit the weaknesses of others. And um, I have a, a passage of scripture that I'd like to read first, Rick, and then I'd like us to kind of just uh, break it down a little bit, okay? So this is Second yeah. Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. It says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never be able, being able uh, and, and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jamus and John Braze opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Let's go ahead, Rick, and uh, break this passage down a little bit. First of all, well, the one thing I, that that I want to mention about this passage is that when he's describing, you know, in this list here in the first uh, few verses, um, lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, some people might think that that's, you know, that that's the world we live in. And, and in a sense it is, but he's describing false teachers in this text. That's who he's describing. And it fits false teachers to a T. Um, I think of uh, w one of the words that jump jumps out to me is abusive, right? Um, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, read um, oh, what is uh, Bully Pulpit by Michael Kruger, Dr. Michael Kruger. Um, that is a really good book if uh, any of you guys out there can get a hold of it. Robin and I were actually, we've used some of the stuff in there. But we were actually going to um, going to do an entire book review on it. But it, it, it's a great book. It's called Bully Pulpit, and that you know, I I think of the Mark Driscolls. Um, I even yeah. think of the Chris Valatins because I I know from talking to people who were members of Bethel that Chris Valatin was was rather abusive. So so anything else that you wanna you wanna discuss there, Rick? Yeah. So just one little thing there. You know, we often hear that people with a form of godliness but deny the power of yeah. people who are against the gifts and healings etc you know we we have a form of godliness we sit in our pews we uh, you know liturgical and we don't really go wild so you know mm. poor us we're missing out on the move of god but actually as you've explained yeah. it is referring to false teachers and 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 if you if you want to go ahead to matthew 7 verse 21 to 23 the passage we know so well you know that yeah well, that's that, you know people People will, uh, let me just find the passage then, Matthew 7. So Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So <laughs> that that is... Uh, these people, one could say, actually had a form of godliness, and their form of godliness was what we see in the NAR and hyper charismatic churches and some charismatic churches. So it's, yeah. it's just an interesting uh, point. Yeah, and you made another good point uh, in, with uh, the passage in Matthew chapter 13 about the sower and the seed. Um, and uh, that was uh, that says, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfaithful. And you were talking about how the w the way that false teachers exploit people, and that is they prey on their weaknesses, you know, uh, like health and wealth, prosperity, that sort of thing. And uh, I have a couple of examples here. I want to play the first one uh, right now, and this is uh, let me look here. Oh, yeah, this is. Uh, 
uh, what, talking about what we hear a lot about, which is sow a seed. So let me get your thoughts on this, okay? Do you need a child to get on fire for God? Then I challenge you to sow a financial seed to get other kids on fire for God. Watch. Do you need healing in your mind or body or in a relationship? I challenge you to sow a seed to bring healing in a young person's life and in their relationships or, or reaching people from a new campus or whatever like that. Watch, are you thinking about starting a new business next year? Are you, th- you have a business idea or a, a, another job maybe you're looking for and you wanna bring more money and that kind of idea? I challenge you to sow a seed in the Father's business and in the heavenly business and in the kingdom of God business and you don't see if he doesn't bless you back so much more. Number six, sow a financial seed for your dreams. You know, the whole universe operates under the law of seed time and harvest. So every dream I've ever had, I sow a seed for it. You know, just like a farmer, he can't just believe God for corn and speak to corn and have a picture of corn in his book and expect corn. He's gotta sow a seed for it, right? It's the same with your dreams. Father, I pray right now for every person that got touched tonight. God, we don't even know the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that happened in this very house. But God, I prophesy that miracle money and provision is coming into their lives. God, in in meetings like this, oftentimes the Holy Spirit will speak to people to sow a seed, to give big. Because if we want to harvest and we want to reap a harvest, we have to sow a financial seed. All right, Rick. So if you want to see your life really blessed if you want to see prosperity in your home and your finances and your and your employment well you gotta sow a seed i mean that's how god works according to these teachers and uh you know i think about the video i did last week with barry bowen and uh the private jets uh we we did that video um and i contacted barry because of keith moore and his article um, and how he he, you know, uh, scammed his audience out of money, so he seventeen million dollars, so he could get a, uh, a another another jet. He's, I think he already had three, so he's getting another one. Um, but but it's all about sowing seed. One of the things he said in that thing was, you know, you, when you sow a seed into this project, talking about the airplane project uh, to get his new plane, when you sow a seed into this project, well, that gives you pretty much, uh, you know, the end with God there. Now, now God can kind of, and I'm, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but just off the top of my head, given mm-hmm. the gist of it. God, God now can work because you're you're sowing a seed here now. Now you're going to be blessed, and that's how they do this. This is exactly how they trap people. We got uh, another clip here, and that is uh, we're going to talk about uh, another way that they exploit people, and that's with the tithe. So check this out. Debt's being broken. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Slip up your hands and begin to receive of the Lord. I cancel debt. <clears throat> over every tither in this building right now. Part of what helps churches build buildings and do what they do because half the people don't tithe. I'm being bold right now. Okay? I want to say every time somebody posts online, well, don't worry about the tax exemption. I want to type back, do you tithe? Because if you don't tithe, get off my page. And he said, if you don't tithe, I can't stop the repercussions and the curses and the bitterness that comes along with that. That's not preacher speak, that's counselor speak. So it says that it may go well with you and that your life may be long on the earth. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. Enters Jesus. When Jesus enters in, he says you are no longer cursed if you don't tithe. That means you can be saved, you can be delivered, you can work in healings and miracles. But when it comes to your finances... You're not cursed, you put a cap. Somebody say, I'm not cursed. I just got a cap. I I wrote it out because I want everybody to hear this and see this very clearly, okay? If you don't tithe and you believe in Jesus, you're not cursed. However, some blessings have terms and conditions. Uh, all right, Rick. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Hogwash. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> That's exactly right. 
tithing that's a, it's a nice way to put it tithing you know when a, when a preacher goes to malachi 3 i know i know you know it's time to leave if he uses that text uh, to to get his church to tithe what they won't tell you right obviously is that this was israel under the old covenant they also won't tell you that tithing was usually agricultural produce mm -hmm. they also won't tell you that the poor didn't have to tithe um, in fact the poor were benefits of the tithe and some occupations uh, didn't have to tithe and uh, the argument i've heard which which is quite common is that well you know if you tell them it was israel under the law they say but you know abraham and melchizedek you know abraham tithed to melchizedek but Abraham tithed from, uh, tithe from the spoils of war, which means I would have to go and rob a bank and then give that uh, to the church. So, and the tithe, in fact, was closer to, I believe, around 30%, not 10%. So mm. it really just is a way to manipulate people. And, and Daniel, if you don't mind, can I just read a, a quote from uh, Bill Johnson? I would love because for you to read a quote from Bill Johnson. A, a lot of people think, you know, Robert Morris infamously said, you know, if you cursed if you don't tithe. But mm -hmm. people aren't aware what Bethel teach. So here's a, from an article. Let me quote Bill Johnson. If I don't give it to God, that's referring to the tithe, then God gives it to the devourer. You never get to keep it. That's the bummer. You withhold it, and what happens? A car breaks down again. Washing machine. Amazing how many times the things that break. Hello, storm comes, a fence blows over, this happens. It's amazing how many crazy things happen for people who just withhold the tithe. Why? because you've become a legal target to the devourer. Does that scare anybody at all? A legal target. God says, yep, it's legal. He's got a bullseye right on his chest. Go for it, just don't take his life. Isn't that a despicable uh, way to that, instill fear in people? Yeah, that, that was just, that was awful. But um, this is how this is what they do, Rick. They will exploit people, and they'll either get them to sow a seed, and you know, and and have you know uh, this teaching that well, you know, unless you're sowing a seed, God can't bless you. Or you know, they'll, they'll say, well, you can sow a seed, but if you're not tithing, you know, tithing's the first step. So you got to tithe first, so that you can, um, you know, so that you can get God to start blessing you in the first place. So it's it's really just that both sowing a seed and tithing kind of go together because they would say, if you're not tithing, then sowing a seed, is, you know, yeah. um, not not that they won't take your 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 seed, you know, even if you're not tithing, they would of course. take your seed, of course. Yeah. But uh, their yeah. teaching is you need to be tithing first anyway. All right, Rick, let's move on to point number three. And point number three is a really important point they false teachers will enti they they entice people they will entice you um you have a quote on your in your article that says this false teachers will never tell you about the cost of following christ but merely what you will gain uh you want to talk about that for just a second sure i mean it's always in terms of uh earthly gain, never spiritual gain, actually, if, if it boils down to that. And uh, the lure that they use to draw people in is a promise uh, either to cure your pain or give you some kind of pleasure. And the cost is never, never mentioned. And and the cost, as we know, Dan, is it's going to cost you everything. Yeah. Obviously, it, yeah. it's 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 not a works-based salvation, but it's a fruit of being saved that, that mm. we are going to suffer. Uh, yeah. I mean, the doctrine of suffering is, is not really popular. It's, it's really ever taught. I think you've got a passage in Matthew that you wanted to read. Right. So yeah, Matthew 10, verse 34 to 39. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against a mother and a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Mm. And this is what false teachers do. They, they offer you life, but it's, 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 uh, it's a lie. It's uh, the promises of this world uh, masquerading under some sort of godly promises, unfortunately. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it that that passage reminds me of what John says in First John: Do not love the world or the things of the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that's what these false teachers are doing. They're they're teaching people to be attached to this world. They're teaching people to love the world. Um, but we're told not to do that, and we're told that the Christian is going to have suffering in this life. You know what I mean? We are going to suffer. Paul makes that very clear. Those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but there are also various other sufferings that we have to go through as well in this life. So, yeah, I mean, um, there's another—it reminds me of the, you know— the, these these false apostles that that are they're living these luxurious lifestyles are nothing like the apostle Paul. Um, there's a passage in, in Corinthians. I think you have that there, and uh, I'd love for you to read that if you would. All right, the, the one in uh, two Corinthians eleven twenty three to thirty. Yeah. Uh, are they are, okay? And this is quite an interesting one because Paul's contrasting himself with uh, against the false apostles in Corinth, and mm-hmm. um, they were eloquent and flashy and showy, and then probably. On the outside, everything was going well with them, and, and in comes Paul, who wasn't even a good speaker. So 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisons, imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journey, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, Mm -hmm. in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from these things, the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Who is weak? And am I not weak? Who is made to fall? And am I not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. What yeah. a contrast <laughs> to modern day apostles <laughs> who boast about, you know, I've got my third jet and uh, yeah. uh, God has blessed me and prosperous me. I haven't got sick and I haven't sinned uh, like Chris Velaton, you know. I can go weeks without sinning. It's just night and day, how, you know, it's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've got a clip that I want to play now. Uh, This is a um, a clip that I entitled God doesn't want you to be poor. Watch these people that are not born again. They only go by what they see. They're in the rim of the census. So we have to take spiritual things that are not in the rim of the census and bring them into a point the way you can understand and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have to be sick. I don't have to be poor. You were the first preacher ever told me that. And at first, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to be honest, on, on top, I said, he, he got to be wrong, because that's just normal. Wait a minute, we're not normal. No. <laughs> well, we're normal. <laughs> yes, yes. The world is abnormal. There you it's go. It's subnormal. There's a lot of things God wants you to have. Let me just teach you for a minute. There's a lot of things God wants you to have. But you know what he wants you to have more than anything else? Have faith in God. God wants you to have prosperity. I'm telling you, God doesn't want you to be poor. God wants you to have victory in every area of your life. It's just a matter of following him. He will always cause you to prosper. It says in 3 John, Uh, Chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. That's God's will for you. God doesn't want you to struggle. He doesn't want you to be poor. God wants to bless you. And if you will follow His directions, God will bless you. All right, Rick, I'm going to get your take on that clip. Jesse Duplantis was the first one in that small compilation of God doesn't want you to be poor. Um, and he's sitting there with Kenneth Copeland, and he's, I, I, I learned that from you. I learned, Boy, I tell you what, if that is the truth, man, Kenneth Copeland doesn't just have his own, uh, you know— <laughs> It's so teaching the answer for, but for influencing all of, and he has, man, he has influenced so many of, of, of these health, wealth, word of faith, prosperity, gospel teachers. I mean, there are a lot of people that Kenneth Copeland, and it's not just, not just uh, the, the average Christian or, or the Christian that's entrapped in, into his teaching. It is 
all of the teachers that he has influenced and that have come out of the cesspool of of um, uh, heresy that yeah. he has he his teachings have influenced and that's you know and now you look at the fact that a lot of this stuff is in it's spread out all over the world we can thank uh the the, the kenneth copeland for a lot of the teaching that's going on over in africa um so yeah. i mean it's just it's it's awful man it, it, it really is but i think you had something you wanted to say about uh andrew womack yeah, just on, on Kenneth Copeland, you know, the prosperity gospel doesn't actually work in Africa. It just enriches, you know, the top yeah. dog. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you speak about Kenneth Copeland, uh, big friends, isn't he Todd, Todd White's mentor? Yes. And then, yes. And then he, you, 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 you know, Bill Johnson gave him a warm welcome when he spoke at Bethel last oh, year. Yeah. So there's, there's oh, a yeah. real cross spot, you know, wolves run in packs, you know, they might, mm. uh, they might, um, sort of being different streams as you like to call it but it's the same pack really but going back to andrew womack i just want to go back to that verse uh, 3 john 1 and uh, you know they'll, they'll quote a portion and they won't really expand it but so let me just read it 3 john 1 verse 2 to 4. Sure. beloved i pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes with your soul well with your soul for i rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So the first thing we need to understand is that this was this was not a principle or a formula uh, for mm -hmm. prosperity. It was like a standard greeting of the day. It's like me meeting you say, hey, Daniel, I trust everything is well with you and Robin and, and things are going well. So it, it wasn't an incantation or a, a formula. But this is what a, a lot of people miss. He says, yeah, I pray that, it may, uh, pray that all may go well with you or prosper and all may be good and that you may be in good health but he says as it goes well with your soul in other words paul's first concern was for the soul of gaius and what was the state of gaius's soul well he says here i rejoice greatly and test the brothers testify to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth so paul was saying i'm so happy that you're walking in the truth and i pray that the rest of your life also goes well you know as your your spiritual state is healthy I pray that you know everything goes well but these false teachers have reversed it so they first want you to have good health and finances and they're not even concerned about truth daniel they don't care yeah. they're just full of lies and nonsense so this is another total uh, butchering of a text taking things totally out of context absolutely and the irony of it just the irony of it that they are using their own false teaching there and they and 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 john is talking about truth <laughs> you know that's yeah, what he's exactly. About. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's exactly what he's talking about. Truth, and yeah. these guys are just—it's just the yeah. irony among these teachers. Uh, it's yeah. just thick, man. It's just yeah. thick. I don't know what yeah. to say, man. I really yeah, don't. It's, uh... Oh, oh boy. Okay, let's move on to number four, which is um, that false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. They are not handling scripture like the Bible says they are to handle scripture. They are actually committing eisegesis and narcissism. So first of all, Rick, uh, I'll get you to explain what eisegesis is. And uh, then after that, I'll get you to explain what narcissism is. So Daniel, the correct way to interpret is exegesis. So usually that's the literal, historical, grammatical method of find out what did the author intend what was his intention and what did the hearers understand the verse to be so i said jesus is sort of reading our own narrative into the text so you read the meaning that you want to the scripture to be so you reading into the text instead of finding taking the true meaning out of the text and then uh, nasa jesus would be really going the whole hog and inserting yourself uh, into the text i think that the, the best way to explain that would be the story of obviously David and Goliath. So mm -hmm. a way to isogeet that text would be find a meaning for each of the five smooth stones that David picked up. Then you can concoct whatever you want. You know, the one stone can be faith, the other one can be tithing, the other one can be binding the devil, mm -hmm. and uh, the other one can be sowing your seed to uh, whoever. And uh, so that would be isogesis. Narsogesis would be when you actually are David and you are slaying Goliath. So that's just a, a simple way to, to understand the basic concept. 
And I got a couple of example clips to play. The first one is uh, the late Jerry Savelle sitting with Kenneth Copeland. Listen to how he takes passages right out of their context. Watch. I found another definition for benefit, and it said financial assistance in time of need. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a benefit. And the Bible says that he wants to daily load us with benefits. Now, over in James chapter 1, it tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father. Every good and every perfect gift. The message translation says every desirable and every beneficial gift comes out of heaven. So there again, James picks up on Psalm 68 and says that, that benefits come from God. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, God says that he has plans, according to the New International Version, he has plans to prosper us, plans to give us hope and a future. The message translation says the future we've hoped for. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. And then 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul tells us that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. The New International Version says He richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. The New American Standard Version says He richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And even the Orthodox Jewish Bible says He grants us all things for our enjoyment. So it sounds like to me, God is interested in making my life better. Praise God. <laughs> oh, oh, man. It's funny, but it's sad at the same time. <laughs> it really is. And that, that's just an example of how they do this. They take verse after verse after verse right out of their context, and they insert their own meaning into the text. And that is just a a great example, I think, of ice and Jesus, and that's how the uh, just every one of these guys do that. Every one of them. Well, one of the things I I, I want to mention uh, before I forget, Rick, have you ever noticed when? It, and if you haven't, do this next time you watch a Kenneth Copeland video. Just focus on because he'll he'll start turning pages of scripture. Look at his Bible. Everything is underlined. I mean, it's like he's got yellow highlights everywhere. Like he has gone through the scriptures and pulled out his doctrine out of. <laughs> I just, just watch. Just next time you you watch a Kenneth okay. Cope, uh, uh video, look, look at that. That's one of the things that I've noticed. But yeah. it, that's that's a prime example of how these guys do it. Um, and unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, the late Jerry Savelle there is, you know, has had to recently well, stand before God. Well, you know, he, he didn't read, he read James 1 verse 17, right? About yeah. every good and perfect gift, but he didn't read verse 11. Let me read James 1 verse 11. Do it. For the sun, the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. <laughs> its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Again, again, the irony is so thick. You could literally cut it with a knife, man. I mean, it's yeah. just it's just insane. I that passage. If you why didn't they read that? Why don't they read that in context? Because it will expose them. That's why they don't. They would they yeah. would feel the hopefully they would feel some kind of guilt. But I don't know, man. Maybe those uh, maybe their consciences are conscious uh, seared. Yeah, yeah, seared uh, and, and by now. So. Then you then you read from uh, was it one Timothy? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think I think he read from one. Oh, he read he read from one Timothy. He read uh, six verse seventeen. God who richly provides us everything to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yes. Why didn't you Why didn't you read the first part of the verse? Let's read the whole verse. Yeah, as do it. For the as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Just the first part of the, vo the verse is like, it exposes them, charge the rich in this yeah. present age uh, not to be, and their hopes is certainly in their money. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that's to them, that's a sign that, that God has blessed them. But, you know, Psalm says the wicked prosper. Uh, yep. So there's that, you know.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Now let's uh, let's let's let me play an example of a uh, someone committing narcissism and probably the best example of this would be Stephen Furtick. And he's going to be putting those people in. uh, (laughs) He's going to be putting the audience that he's preaching to preaching to. um, He's going to be putting them in um, well into the text into the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho watch. Here's the thing God sent me to tell you. You might be on your sixth lap around the walls of Jericho, and this next one might be the one that brings the walls down. Look at me, man. This is what the children of Israel had been doing for 40 years in the wilderness, circling the same path in the wilderness for 40 years under Moses' leadership. So here comes Joshua, and he's supposed to take them into the Promised Land. And This is like when you finally see an improvement. You finally see a possibility. You finally see a little light. You finally see a little hope. And Now Joshua, the first instruction he gives them is to start taking laps just like they've been doing for the last 40 years. And you got to think these guys are asking each other as day after day passes and they keep circling the same walls, the same city, like, man, how many more times are we going to do this? And that's exactly where some of you are asking God today how much longer is it going to be like this? Because, see, if God would tell me how many laps I had to take, I'd be good. I could just set my clock. This is how long it is. This is how much it is. This is what it's going to take. And then I could just settle in and I can walk. It's no problem. I'll walk. But Joshua never told the people how many times they would have to walk. Why? God doesn't want you to trust in your knowledge. He doesn't want you to trust in your senses. He wants to know will you take another lap even when you don't know if these walls are ever going to fall? All right. One of the things that you, you, you saw Stephen Furtick there. He's he's narcissizing the chat, the text. He's placing uh, you into the text rather than exegeting the text. So uh, he he's doing two things there. He's narcissizing and he's eisegeting. Because when you when you narcissize a text, you're obviously eisegeting the text as well because you're you're interpreting your own meaning into the scripture, even though you're throwing yourself into uh, the scriptures there so he as well so he's doing both there he's 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 putting his own meaning there into the text and he's also um he's also putting his audience into the text as well which is um just an example that's i just wanted to play an example and he he's good at doing that kind of thing he really is um so let's go ahead and talk about number five because we are not rick unfortunately we are we are rolling here and we're not going to have time to go over uh, all ten, like I said earlier. So again, the 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 link to the article will be put in the YouTube description. Um, but number five, and the final one we're going to look at today is that these teachers are eloquent. And you have a I, I took a quote from uh, that passage from number uh, number five, and this is what it says: False teachers will mesmerize their followers with stories, television. Uh, I'm sorry, stories, testimonies. Yes and new revelations. Uh, you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, remember we spoke about you know the Apostle Paul comparing himself to the, the eloquent false apostles of Corinth, and he says, you know, I'm unskilled. But uh, the idea is to really captivate people. So it's uh, yeah. if you look at Bethel, uh, I reckon half of their success, or what really draws people in, is that, you know, you've heard a sermon at Bethel, like, for about 20 minutes, they, they have testimony time, and they actually believe that there's a sort of power in a testimony to repeat itself. So, for example, God at one at one point was supposedly healing autistic children, and so they would get up in the next service here and give the testimony because apparently that testimony of God would do the same thing because that specific anointing was there. So stories and, and testimonies are really a vital cog in the machinery in the in the in the uh, false church. Um, so it's testimonies, stories, and of course, you know, what do we have to say about new revelations? You know, yeah. if you take away new revelations, you're taking away the bread and butter yep. of just about every 
a modern day apostle and prophet, they have to come up uh, with something new. Even there at the beginning of that clip, you heard Stephen Furtick say, God told me to tell you this. So these guys have, have created themselves, they've, they've put in themselves in a, in a mediator position between yep. God and the poor ordinary Christian, who unfortunately, you know, hasn't uh, learned how to hear the voice of God like these uh, apostles or prophets or celebrity teachers. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I, when, when you're talking about Bethel there, I've got a clip now of Brian Simmons, because that's what this reminded me. Brian Simmons, who was you know, given a mandate from Jesus Christ himself to write a new translation of the Bible. Now, he's not he's at Bethel. So he's not on Sid Roth. So he's not he's not too, too crazy. He's not going to talk about his his, uh, you know, his vision of Jesus in detail. But check this clip out. I had a divine encounter and I'm going to understate and under uh, I'm not going to exaggerate anyway. I'm going to understate exactly what happened. But I had an encounter, and I was given this commission to do this work. And nobody in their right mind would translate. Do you know how many books there are in the Bible? I mean, I thank God I'm not Catholic. I don't have to do the Apocrypha. <laughs> but there's a lot of books. There's a lot of verses, a lot of genealogies, you know. And he promised that he would help me and he would give me secrets and he would show me things and he would give me divine supernatural help for eight, almost eight years, a little over seven years. He has helped us as we've traveled and ministered. Uh, we take our laptop and we, we work on this translation. I did two verses today. When you get First John, I did some of First John here in Reading. Uh, so I, I really am obsessed, really am fascinated with this. I love this calling that is on our lives. I feel like I have job security for a while till I finish. I may drag it, no. Uh, we wanna get this as soon as we can. Actually, by this time next year, we'll be finished with the New Testament, the Passion Translation, it'll be done. And it'll be in a theological review period. We have theologians going through it and uh, we've got editors going through it and uh, it'd be great to come and hand each of you a leather bound New Testament after you pay for it. And. Uh, all right, that was just one example there. And one of the things he said there that that you know that really should be discussed is the secrets that were given to him by Jesus about this translation. So what you're going to find according to the audacity of Brian Simmons is that he has been given divine secrets that no one else has ever heard before. And so that is what you're going to get when you buy a trans, you know, when you buy a transla translation, because it's not a translation, by the way, it is not a translation at all. Um, and so when you buy the passion uh, book, because it's not the Bible either, when you buy the passion, um, that's that's what he's implying there. You're going to you're going to learn things from Jesus that um, nobody else knows secrets. And if that that implies even that these are things that the apostles didn't talk about in scripture yeah and i think the word they use one of the nr buzzwords is downloads you know god gave them downloads yeah. and uh mm -hmm. i believe i believe he said he claims that the angel that was given the assignment to assist him was <laughs> the angel's name was passion and that's how he came up with the uh, passion translation but he's just a plain liar he's just a total yeah. fraud um yeah that's all you know and, and that uh, translation is good for the art house that's all it's good for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And think about that, though. How, how many false teachers uh, that, that aren't even in the Christian church that are cults that have had the assistance or the communication with angels? You think of Joseph Smith. Uh, you can think of Muhammad. Um, all of these, uh, you can go throughout uh, different cults and you can find people who have started their cults because of, of angels. And that, that just not saying that uh, Brian Simmons is... Um, you know, uh, starting a cult or part of a cult, but that is kind of a of a uh, similarity there that I that, that I wanted to mention. Um, so yeah, that's what that kind of reminded me of. But then you, you mentioned these teachers that are really good speakers, and one of the one of the things as I'm reading the um, the article on this point that's remind it's reminded me of uh, Patricia Schreier because she is someone who is extremely eloquent. 
when she when she speaks. She has, as Chris Roseborough says, she has chops. I mean, she really does know how to yeah. how to captivate an audience. But she teaches falsely as well. I got a clip from her watch. There ought to come a time in your relationship with the Lord where hand-me-down revelation just doesn't do it for you anymore. There ought to come a little bit of disconcerting, a little bit of maturity in your walk with God where you become a little bit unsettled to only be spoon-fed the Word of God from someone else to you. Now we thank God for our pastors and our teachers and our leaders that help us to rightly divide the Word of Truth, but there ought to come a time in your life where you've decided, you know what, I want fresh revelation with my name on it that has come straight from God's Spirit for my life. Because you know, we can be handicapped as Christians. We can live our whole lives leaning on revelation that, that is spoon-fed to us from other people instead of knowing that the exact same Holy Spirit of God that lives in that person whose faith we might rightfully admire, that the same Holy Spirit of God that lives in them also lives in you to teach you all things. Priscilla. Oh, uh, did I call, what did I call her, Patricia? You said Patricia, Patricia. Ah, yes, I, I apologize, yeah. folks. Priscilla Schreier. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, maybe I had Patricia King on the game, or Patricia, <laughs> yeah. Patricia King on the brain. But yeah, so Pr Priscilla Schreier, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. She's the daughter of um, Tony Evans, I believe. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so do, notice there how she is, you know, just kind of degrading, not kind of, but degrading scripture, elevating um, the rhema word or this direct revelation that you can somehow hear from the Holy Spirit, supposedly, uh, and how she's elevating that over scripture. You know, we don't want to be spoon fed. We want our own revelation. And you and I were originally going to be talking about the sufficiency of Scripture. I think we should do another episode and and talk about that. Um, and that's another good clip to bring in again. But um, that is just uh, that is just awful stuff there, and very blasphemous. And this is a teacher that's well respected um, in the church right now. Yeah, I mean, doesn't she understand the, the doctrine of illumination? How the the Holy Spirit illuminates the Scriptures to all believers. And, and then I've seen, I mean, this is one of the biggest issues with people who have come out of the NNR or Word of Faith, whatever. The biggest thing they struggle with is because of this specific teaching, and, you know, hearing the voice of God and getting private revelations, that when they exit, they, they, they really have to almost like uh, get to know God and His Word all over again, because they basically had a relationship with the thoughts in their head. And now they yeah. discover, you know, yeah. it actually wasn't God. And yeah. it's so, so dangerous, and it's leading countless mm -hmm. uh, people into mysticism and uh, private revelations and private interpretations, and it's a toxic diet, uh, uh, and it's a rabbit hole. You will never perfect hearing the voice of God. And yeah. uh, as we know, you know, God has spoken infallibly through his scriptures, and God has never struggled to get a message through to his children, ever. Yeah. He can use a donkey. He can use a donkey. So, uh, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes donkeys are a lot better than a lot of the people we, you see on your program. They make yeah. more sense than these false apostles and prophets. Um, Rick, if it's okay with you, I would like to circle back to number one, because, uh, and that is it, it, them being established. You know, that, that false teachers, have a, they're established in the church. And the reason why I want to circle back uh, before we close is because of the whole Michael Brown thing again. Um you know, Michael Brown supporting guys like Kevin Zadai. I want to play a clip from Kevin Zadai, and I want to get your take on this. And if I understand correctly, this story of him being in heaven with Jesus was in his book. But uh, check this clip out, and uh, then let me know what you think. Watch. He started to talk to me. He said, most people think about the suffering that I did before I died on the cross, the beatings, um, the imprisonments, but he said it went far beyond that. It went far beyond the cross. It went far beyond that, Kevin. He said, I spent those days in the belly of the earth alone without God. And it shocked me at first because I never thought that. He said, I relinquished my communication with the Father for those days. He said, the only thing that I had 
was those psalms that I had memorized. And he said, I rehearsed those and I kept telling myself that there was coming that point if I set the Lord always before me. And because he was at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And it talked about how he would be brought out, that he would not allow his body to see decay. His soul would not be left in hell. And um, he told me, he said, I rehearsed those things. He said, those demons were telling me that I had failed, that I had been left alone and my mission was a failure. He told me, uh, Satan told me, he said, you should have taken the deal I gave you in the desert where I offered you to you all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you, you could have had them if you bowed down to me, but look at you now, you've lost everything. He said, I just kept rehearsing the word of God. And so he explained this to me. And as he was telling me this, he started to sob and it touched me. He said, I cleared out a space in your own soul, Kevin, when I did this, because when you pray, you pray from the depths. The audacity, just the audacity of people like Kevin Zadai and Brian Simmons, that Jesus has got him in heaven with him, and he's just being so intimate with Brian. He's got his, I can just picture he's got his arm around him, and he's just sobbing, and Brian's there going, it's okay, Jesus. All right, I, I'm here. I'm here. I, it's just so, it brings up that kind of picture. It is so disgusting to me to to listen to this kind of stuff. Um, and then Brian Simmons, of course, wh who we looked at a few minutes ago, uh, who is just, you know, thinks he's the, um, he, he's the one that God commissioned to bring this new translation. It's the audacity of these people, you know. And Chris Rosebro did a really good job um, on that particular book that I was referring to from Kevin Zadai. So I'll put a link to Chris Rosebro's video in the YouTube description so people can check that out. You need to do that. It's a really solid video. Um, but anyway, so what what are your thoughts on that? You know, depraved in the mind, deprived of the truth. Uh, you know, if you believe that, I've got a bridge, Sicilian Brooklyn. And of <laughs> yeah. course, you know, yeah. Jesus uh, said to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise, mm -hmm. not hell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it's just unbelievable that people can believe yeah. the stories of these guys. Yeah, yeah. And 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 if you go back to uh, older word of faith teachers like Frederick Price, who taught that, uh, you know, Jesus was in the pit of hell and the demons were mocking him and tormenting him. Kenneth Copeland, too. Um, yep. Mocking him. Joyce, and tormenting him. Joyce Meyer. Yep, exactly. Joyce Meyer, too. And they would say that these people went to hell and were tormented there rather than at the cross. And, and you heard what Kevin said. I said, oh, it went beyond the cross. It went beyond the cross. Yeah. So that is that is just not that is just not biblical. It, Jesus said it is finished. Now, Peter does talk about Jesus descending uh, and into the depths, but um, we don't know. We, we can't take that passage and make an entire doctrine out because it, it, it's not clear. Enough. It's not a clear passage. You know, the Apostles Creed. Uh, which we quote every Sunday, says he descended into hell on the third day. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from uh, then he, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. So that's all they say. He descended into hell. That doesn't it doesn't mean that he paid the penalty for sins in hell. And yeah. uh, that is not uh, uh, Peter is not clear on that. And so I don't know yeah. if that's where they get their uh, that idea from. But Jesus paid the penalty there at the cross. There at the cross, uh, our sins were placed upon him. He was punished for our sins. And then he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. Yeah. It is over. It is done. So anyway, Rick Becker, I enjoyed myself immensely. This was a great interview, and I want to get together again to talk about the sufficiency of Scripture. I think that is very a very important topic, so we will go ahead and discuss that. I'll put a link to, like I said, to all of your stuff down in the YouTube description. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Dan. It was really good to be with you. Yeah, yeah, great to be with you, too. All right. Yeah. Folks, thank you so much for watching. I do hope this video has been helpful, and if it has, if if you know someone who are who's caught up in false teaching, please, please, please send this video to them. And uh, folks, uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.